All right, my friends, I am here. Today is that long anticipated opportunity uh, that I've been talking about, about taking my channel on the road and interviewing some people. I'm really excited. Like, I am, I am really giddy. So we're gonna have two history nerds talk to each other um, in a very kind of casual way, not like any formal news type interview at all. Uh, just look behind me where we are. Yes. I feel so, so blessed to have this opportunity to, to live in my state and have this this treasure uh, here for me to um, ex you know talk about and hopefully show you, get you guys excited, if not about my local history and state history, but maybe you to go out and find your own local state national history because there's so many treasures all around us. All we have to do is just look and find them. Um, so, uh, bear with me. Here we go. Uh, oh, and by the way, I had to cross two specific roads. I had to cross Hancock Drive, which those of you who watch my channel know I do Civil War stuff. So that's pretty exciting. And Hopewell. And that's the hint for what this video is going to be about. So, here we go, guys. Hi, welcome to Mr. Dyer's Museums. I'm Mr. Dyer, and today we have a very special guest with us today, and uh, we're going to talk about the largest artifact that we've ever discussed on this channel. And I'm really excited about it. I'm giddy, in fact, about it. Some of you who follow my channel for a while know that this has been coming, so I hope you're just as excited as me. Today we have Mr. Brad Leffer. Sir, thank you so much for joining us. Will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a curator of archaeology for the Ohio History Connection. I've been there working in one capacity or another for like 30 plus years. I actually started working in this museum. I was hired to be the curator for the Newark Earthworks in Flint Ridge. And I was here for several years, then I got transferred to Columbus. Um, but much of my career has been spent researching and learning more about the Hopewell Earthworks here, its relationship to Flint Ridge, and to other Hopewell sites in Ohio. That's awesome. So we are here at the Great Circle Mounds here in Newark, Ohio. And I'm really excited about it because it seems to me like this is one of the um, unspoken treasures of Ohio. People who study about the mound builders, they know about the Great Serpent Mounds, they possibly know about Fort Ancient and some of the Adena and other Hopewell areas, but the Great Circle Mound, which is really easy to get to if you come into Newark, and we're gonna talk about why that is, here in a little bit. Um, if you get a chance, come out here and visit this. And Mr. Lepper is the archeologist, the foreknown specialist on this site. And I'm really excited to talk about it. So we're gonna talk about the history of the site. We're gonna talk about the people that built it and the means or methods that they used to build it and some hypothesis as to why it exists, okay? okay? So let's start about the location. Uh, as I was telling him right before we started filming, I had a high school geography teacher who taught me that uh, geography is destiny. And this site in particular certainly screams that. So why was this site in particular like the place that they decided to build this? Well, I think geography had a lot to do with it. It's the closest place you can get to Flint Ridge and still have a big flat place on which to build a set of earthworks like this. We're also surrounded by three streams. You've got the uh, Raccoon Creek north of us, the South Fork of the Licking River to the east, and Ramp Creek to the south. And the tributaries of Ramp Creek and tributaries of Raccoon Creek almost meet up in the hills over there. So it's like a triangle of land surrounded by water. And I think that fits into American Indian cosmologies that uh, the world is, the, the middle world that we live in is surrounded by water and water is underneath it. It's the beneath world and the above world above us. And the Newark Earthworks are kind of like a, 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 a mini cosmos of the world surrounded by water with the sky world above that we'll talk about later, how the Earthworks bring the sky world down to Earth too. Fascinating, fascinating. So now 
when I think about early Ohio as the settlers come in, I picture a landscape just full of trees everywhere, like untouched woodlands. If I was a settler coming here in the 1800s or 1700s, would I find woodlands? You would find a lot of woodlands, but okay. it would be interspersed with prairies. There were some of those, some natural, some left over from prairies that were actually created and maintained by American Indians for thousands of years. So are these, you said prairies that are created and maintained. How did the Native Americans create prairie land? Well, it probably started a long time ago, possibly as early as the Paleo-Indian period, 10, 15,000 years ago, as the, sort of the ice sheets were receding, the landscape was pretty open, people may have had, you know, seen the trees growing up, and they may have just started then keeping parts of that landscape clear by periodic burning. Okay. I mean, Hunter-gatherer peoples all over the world do this, and it's a way of raising the game, the game density, the density of game animals in, in the environment. A, a forest doesn't have very many deer in it, but a forest with lots of openings has lots of deer. There are even letters that American Indians wrote to, like the governors of early territory, saying, "The people won't, don't let us burn. We have to burn. This is the way we manage our land." So, really? Yeah. So uh, I used to work at Slate Run Living Historical Farm, and I learned while working there that hunting in the 1800s, like finding deer was actually pretty hard to find in the late 1800s until the Ohio Department of Natural Resource Agriculture, uh, they did some management here. So what you're saying is the Native Americans knew way back then how to manage the forest and how to make sure that you had the game here to sustain themselves. Yeah, I mean, if, if anybody ever thought that American Indians were savages, well, the Great Circle and the Newark Earthworks demonstrate that that's not true. But even before then, thousands of years before then, this was never a wilderness when people were here since, since the Paleo-Indians 14,000 years ago. This has been a managed landscape. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. So uh, now when we look at the landscape here, and you're talking about the Paleo-Native Americans, now, they, did they move off, did they shift away, or did they leave their ancestors here and eventually that became what we know as the Hopewell people? It's a little bit of all that. I mean, it's like today, you know, when you, you have family and you have children, some of them go away somewhere else, some of them stay here and have families on their own. The same thing would have been true back then. And yeah, I mean, we talk about these different cultural periods, the Paleo Indian and then the Archaic period, but those are, what, what makes those lines are changing ways of life. Okay. It would be like if there were no written histories, us thinking about, well, what happened to those mysterious covered wagon people or those those weird Model T Ford people? What did they disappear? Did they go away? No, they're our grandparents and our great great grandparents. We've changed our culture over time. And the same thing's true for the fourteen thousand years of American Indian history. Some of the Native American tribes that were here in historic times were the direct descendants of people that were here in the Ice Age. That's cool. Okay, so let's talk about the Hopewell, because this site is specifically uh, tagged to the Hopewell culture, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about those people, where they might have originated from, some of their customs and family life and things like that? Well, the Hopewell people, uh, the Hopewell culture, let's say, um, they're not a tribe. Hopewell culture, it's a, it's a term of art in archaeology. We like to think it encompasses sort of a, a group of people over time, and, and they had common practices. But given the extent of the influence of the Hopewell culture, which we can measure based on the artifacts found in their mounds, and here I'm going off on a tangent, but I think it's an important tangent. In many Hopewell mounds, probably in the mounds that were here at Newark as well, but they were just destroyed. Certainly the mounds in Chillicothe have artifacts that include shells from the Gulf of Mexico, copper from the Great Lakes, and obsidian, a black volcanic glass. Of course, it's volcanic, so it came from a volcano. We don't need volcanoes in Ohio. Every volcano has its own chemical fingerprint. The obsidian found in Hopewell Mounds almost entirely comes from Yellowstone Park. Oh, wow. So I think and we'll sort of jump to the end of the, the program here, I think this was a pilgrimage center, and people came from thousands of miles to come here, bringing offerings from the ends of the world, and to participate in the ceremonies that were taking place here. So 
to that extent, the Hopewell culture, you, you could imagine, conceives all of that. But as we define it, the Hopewell culture is focused in southern Ohio, central and southern Ohio, mostly the, the southward flowing river drainages that flow into the Ohio, the Miami, the Scioto, and the Muskingum. And they lived here between about AD 1 and 400. And they lived in tiny little communities. They're so small, archaeologists don't even call them villages. They're like homesteads, huh. or, uh, or just like a couple of families living together. And they would have been scattered around here. And hundreds, if not thousands, of those communities must have come here to build this incredible architecture and to engage in the ceremonies that took place here. And one of the things that's almost unique about Hopewell is that they built monumental architecture on an incredible scale. And I don't know about you, but when I was in school, we learned about the civilizations of the world. And civilization had the, was defined by six or seven characteristics. You know, monumental architecture, a hierarchical leadership pattern with a, with a king or a pharaoh at the top and nobles and so on. Systems of writing. Um, oh, there's a whole bunch, and I tend to forget about them all. But the Hopewell had monumental architecture and none of that other stuff. They didn't have leaders. I mean, they had ceremonial leaders. People were buried in mounds with lots of stuff. But when you get down into the details and study their way of life, those people, their, their muscle attachments on their bones indicated they worked just as hard as everybody else. They ate the same foods as everybody else. The houses that they lived in, all the houses are basically the same. A thousand years later in the Mississippian culture, Cahokia in Illinois with its giant pyramid, that was a city with maybe 20,000 people living in it. And the leader lived up on top of that pyramid in a big house and he had more access to meat, he had, uh, didn't have to work, um, and, and he could tell people what to do and they did it. And the Hopewell did things as amazing as Cahokia here, but without all the things that made it possible for Cahokia to, to be built. So that's one of the neat things about the, about the, the Hopewell. So, and in addition to all that, monumental architecture, they also had this interaction sphere. That, that I was taught originally was a trade network. Uh -huh. But there, people in Ohio aren't sort of, Ohio, stuff from Ohio isn't going in the other direction. All this stuff is coming into Ohio, small mountains of obsidian and other, other things, seashells, but very little stuff from Ohio is going out. So that's why I think these places were built for pilgrims to come, large numbers of people. This isn't a community church. The previous culture, the Adena culture, built small circles, about 200 feet across. Those would be the equivalent of community churches. This is a cathedral, you know, that, that drew people from the ends of the world to come here and experience the special magic that took place here. Okay, so as being the cathedral, what initially was done to uh, get rid of the idea that this was a fortification because as a western person coming in here I see a big circle I see a, only a few openings oh uh, why was this not a fort and you, you almost have like moats in various areas well one of the quick one of the obvious reasons is the location of the moat okay it's on the inside of the circle okay which is exactly where you wouldn't put it if you intended it to be defensive the moat is for people to fall in if they're trying to attack your walls um, the fact that the ditch is on the inside of the circle almost guarantees that it's not a fort. Okay. Um, there was a guy back in the 1800s that was convinced it was a fort, even though the ditch was inside the walls, and he said it was constructed on principles of military science, now lost or inexplicable. <laughs> I mean, the man was convinced it was a fort, and he was going to twist the facts to make his interpretation right no matter what. Okay. So... Going off of that this is a cathedral, and based off of which came first, the chicken or the egg, why are people from the known central United States coming here to bring their gifts? Now, was this place built and that drew people in? Or do you think possibly that it was built to specifically draw people in? Or, you know, how did that all kind of tie in together? What, what exactly happened? Well, once it's built, of course, then it's like a spiritual magnet that would draw people that would hear about it. But I think, I mean, it's 
it's a question that fundamentally I can't answer. I can't give you the answer because there aren't historic records from that period. But it would be like asking someone why Mecca or why Jerusalem if you didn't have a Quran or a Bible. Right. So you don't you don't know what charismatic person here had a vision, had a concept of how people should live their lives that caught on and, and convinced people that yes, this is the way to go. We want to build this monumental temple to line up with the cosmos so that you know we can do great things here. Um, we know that happened here, but we can't say why or what that gospel was preached by the people that founded this. That makes sense. Okay, so you, you spoke earlier about the homestead, and that kind of, that's interesting because as a little kid growing up, black and white, and you know, the westerns and things like that, when you think about Native Americans, I think uh, traditionally we think about the Plains Indians and how they're nomadic. But here in the eastern woodlands, are are these people nomadic? Well, they're they're not they're they're, they're sedentary. They, they're living in these small communities, but those communities wouldn't have been they wouldn't have lived there for you know hundred years. Okay. Uh, eventually, you have the soil depletion issues from growing the crops there, so those communities probably moved from time to time. And an abandoned community would grow up in blackberries and other kinds of food. So they would still sort of go back to those lands, you know, as part of their foraging routine. But they probably wouldn't move very far. And, and there would still be the familiar territories. They would still know where to hunt and fish and find the fruit and, and vegetables that they wanted to gather. So for the most part, are the people kind of breaking away from... Uh, hunting, gathering, and uh, going more into agriculture. They're purposely planting things for crops. Well, the Hopewell have the perfect mix because before the Hopewell people are hunter-gatherers, and that's a very rich and diverse diet. You get you know the best of everything. You get big game. You get game animals. You get the gathering of, of wild plant foods. Later peoples, like the Mississippian peoples, they're eating mostly corns, especially the commoners. Mm -hmm. So their diet is diminished. Their health is diminished, they're not as tall. Um, but the Hopewell are sort of right in the middle. They have the hunting gathering diet, but they also have these native plants that they grow in their gardens that supplement that. Because hunter gatherers, in spite of the diversity of the diet, during the winter in this at this latitude, they often starve. And when you study their bones and teeth, you can find lines in the bones and teeth that indicate periods of starvation. Huh. The Hopewell had that diverse diet, and during the winter they had stored foods left over, you know, from their the agriculture that they were they were pursuing. So they had the best of both worlds, and the Hopewell people are the tallest, healthiest people, you know, in that entire sequence from 14,000 years ago to the historic era. Okay. So the the type of people, the uh, the the civilization, if you will, this is going to be a religious culture, right? So you're going to have a shaman or priest type caste? Or? It's, certainly you have people who take on those roles when they're here for the ceremonies. But it's not like they are perhaps specially venerated people that are live in a bigger house, because we know that's not true. Okay. But the one artifact you do have from the Newark burial mounds is an amazing stone sculpture of a person, could be a man, could be a woman, you can't tell because they're wearing this big bear robe, uh -huh. and they have a bear's head on their head and bear claws on their claws, and it seems to be a representation of a shaman in the very act of transforming. Okay. And in fact, I've got a video somewhere on YouTube showing that it won't stand up. It's, it's made sort of, it's like a guy in a half sitting position, and if you could set it down, it would just fall over. So I think it's meant to be held and to be actually perhaps used in storytelling. Because if you're holding a figurine and this is the head, you can just tilt it forward and it becomes a bear. And then you tilt it back and it turns back into a person. Oh, wow. But I say man or woman because in historic times, both men and women could have the role of wearing bear regalia in their ceremonies in many, many American Indian tribes. And so, but with a bear robe and it's just a face, you can't tell if it's a man or a woman. So this artifact that you're speaking of, is this the one that was in uh, your article that you wrote that they were holding a skull or holding a head? It is the person's holding a decapitated head in their lap. Um, many people have called that like a trophy head. Okay. And in Hopewell burials, you can often find a person buried 
with a skull next to them. And those have often been called trophy skulls. But we have no representations in, in folklore art of warfare. In all the human really? in all the human bones we've studied, we don't have any Hopewell people with spear points stuck in their sides or what are called parry fractures, a broken arm and then you hold it up, somebody's gonna hit you with a club, and that, that's a very typical warfare injury or a bashed in skull. And and if you think about it, to have this level of cooperation over such a huge area, if warfare was a problem, nobody would travel here from Wyoming or Florida because they would get involved in conflict. So this seems to have been a period of peace. There doesn't seem to be warfare. And the only artistic representation we have of this head is this priest holding the head, not a warrior. In later Mississippian cultures, you've got shell carvings of a warrior with an ax in one hand and a human head in the other. Uh -huh. That's clearly warfare related. That's a trophy head or you know, scallop or whatever. Um, this, I think, is, is similar to Christian, early Christians that would take body parts of saints you know, and keep them in a box and they had spiritual power. So I think this is perhaps an honored ancestor that this shaman is communing with and perhaps asking, you know, tell the great spirit that we need rain for the crops or, or something like that. Right, right. Now, oh, that's interesting. I, I, that kind of branches off in a whole other set of ideas in my head. That's, that's fascinating. Okay, um, so we, we don't have war going on because I was actually going to ask you if maybe it was sacrificial or something like that, but it kind of makes sense, like you said, you have your ancestors, almost like the uh, the Mesoamericans, the their ancestors, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Now it's not a fort. It's definitely religious. Let's talk a little bit about um, how how it was built. You said it was peaceful. Now, if you had war, um, there would be interruptions because this is huge. In fact, uh, I wrote some notes in here about how big it was to, uh, from the article that you wrote. It says that the uh, it deviates by less than four foot of being perfectly circular. It is the octagon, which there's several parts. I'll put a map on the video. But the octagon is 50 acres huge, and that's attached to this. Originally, it was attached. No, no, you're talking about the, the, the observatory circle in the octagon, which is over the octagon. Earth yes. Earth. So we have massive sizes. Yeah. The Great Pyramid could fit inside the square that's really close here. Yeah, the square would have been about a mile that way. You have four coliseums could fit in the octagon. Yep. Uh, Stonehenge could fit inside the smaller circle. Yep. Like so, these are like visual representations of showing like how big they are. Yeah. And and like the walls, the walls are huge. Um, let me see if I can find my notes about the height. Walls varied in height from five to fourteen foot. That's a lot of dirt. That's a lot of dirt in an entire circumference. Well, if you look at the entire Newark earthworks. One estimate is that there were 7 million cubic feet of earth moved to build the whole Newark earthworks. So if you did have interruptions of war, we could see that in the building of these places, right? Like you would have pauses and starts and things like that? It would depend on how long you had to stop digging. And, and, and I'll, but I think we can take warfare out of the equation, though, simply because there's just no evidence for it at this period. And these never could have served as forts. So for, for Hopewell, I think you can just set warfare aside. Good. Okay, so we have small hamlets, or, or yeah, you said homesteads. Homesteads, hamlets, uh, 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 people. You have people from all over central United States uh, to the, the Appalachian Mountains coming here, right? Are they all helping? All these different cultures, are they possibly not only um, contributing offerings, but are they also possibly helping build it? Or yes, how do we get possibly people? absolutely and i think that level of, of of cooperation gives people an investment in what's happening here uh, allows them to sort of say this is part of something that i contributed to so yeah and and also that would be a way for these small populations to marshal the labor to build something so huge was to get them to come for the religious experience but part of that experience is contributing to building your books maybe okay so we talked about the land, why it was picked out, and kind of the lineage of that. We talked about the Hopewell people and its culture, um, and we talked, we established that this is a religious site. So let's talk about how was this built, or, or not how it was built, but, but why religiously, how religiously was it used? 
Well, let's talk about how to. Because okay. this is one of the things that's really interesting. Because the technology, the tools that people used to build this was simple in the okay. extreme. Pointed sticks, clamshell hose, and maybe hose made out of the shoulder blade of a deer, and baskets. And they would dig up the earth with their pointed sticks, shovel it in with a hoe, carry it on their backs, and one basket load at a time for seven million cubic feet of earth to build these earthworks. So the technology is simple, but encoded in these earthworks is incredible knowledge of geometry and astronomy. And that is one of the things that suggests a, a, a profound ceremonial purpose. Because that, I mean, Pythagoras, when he was dealing with geometry, it was, you know, getting into the mind of God. It was a, it was a sacred kind of thing. For the Greeks, I think it was similar here. And astronomy, lining these earthworks up to the rising and setting of the moon and sun, is, is not a, a calendar. You don't need to build a gigantic earthwork like this to make a calendar. I, could, I think of it as like a giant earthen gear okay. that's made to fit into the gears of heaven and when they line up, you know, special things happen. The octagon earthworks, the circle in the octagon, the main axis of that site over there, lines up to where the moon rises at its northernmost point on the eastern horizon. And I've had the privilege of standing in there to watch that alignment along that ax axis. And it's, the hairs on the back of my neck stood off. It's, it's really amazing. One of the things that's cool is just to be an archeologist studying these ancient people, stand where they stood and watch the moon that they watched rise in alignment with that architecture. You know, and it's so, it's, you feel such a connection. But it was a way for them to feel connected to the cosmos to make their ritual centers align in alignment with the rhythms of the cosmos. Okay, that's cool. So you, you, you pointed out something that I was going to touch on. It's not a calendar. Like when you think about ancient sites being lined up with the sun or the moon, maybe you go back again to Mesoamerica, yeah. where the, they are specifically designed to represent specific days of the year. So this is not a solar calendar, this is not a lunar calendar, this is more or less just a respect of that relationship you spoke about at the very beginning. I think so, because you don't need this for a calendar. Well, and if you've been a farmer all your life, you don't need an earthwork to tell you when it's time to plant. Okay. I mean, you're sensitive to, you know, what kinds of bugs are coming out or what the trees are doing. It's like, now it's time to, to you know, sow the you know, crop, plant the crops. I mean, you're just, those, those rhythms of nature are part of you. You don't need to look at the calendar to see when the plant crops off, I think. Okay. That's, that's cool. So, let's, can you, can you go a little bit more into the religion aspect and how the relig religious leaders would have used this for their faith. Do we have any explanation? Did they, did they have any animals that they attached representation to, or was it really mostly um, the sky, the earth, the water? It's, that's the religion. In, in that sense, I, I suppose it's the latter, because animals are important, but there's no singular animal that, that's that's of particular importance. I mean, the Hopewell effigy pipes um, that we found at both Mound City and Chillicothe and in Tremper down, uh, down on the, well, I can't remember what town it's here, but it's uh, on the Cider River down there where it almost at the end of where it meets the Ohio. Uh -huh. um, we found these deposits of, I don't know, 50, 80, 100 of these pipes, small little platform pipes with an animal effigy on it. and. Uh -huh. You would be smoking it, and almost uh, invariably the animal is looking at you. So we imagine that these are shamanic devices, that they'd be smoking the native tobacco, which was very potent and could send you into a trance. And you're looking into the eyes of perhaps your spirit animal as you're going into that trance. But at some point, these 80 or 100 people all surrendered their pipes. They were probably put in a leather bag. The fit pipes were smashed and then burn. So it's it's some big change in the religion took place there early in the Hopewell period. Uh -huh. And it may be from individual shamanic practitioners who would have used those in their ceremonies 
to more of a, a priesthood with priests performing the same kinds of ceremonies um, on a bigger scale for the community instead of sort of one to one. Although I'm sure that continued too. Now, in uh, the article that you sent me, you mentioned that they found caches of going back to like gifts of like the, yeah. the um, obsidian and things like that, but they had found caches of like spears with spear points pointed down in a cylinder. They also found caches of uh, flint, like the arrowheads, they found the cores and things like that also. Uh, do you, we know exactly how those particular caches might have tied into their ceremonies of religion? Is there any evidence or anything for us to hypothesize? I'd be speculating, but I, I could see those as being offerings okay. to the gods, to the spirits, uh, to in exchange for spiritual power, enlightenment, understanding, or, or it also probably affected your social status too, to some extent, that if you could afford to give all these artifacts to a, to a, a sacrificial offering, um, you know, it would reflect well on you in the community. Mm -hmm. It would say that you were devoted to the religion, you were someone who could be trusted and, and maybe worthy of having one of those priesthood positions or something like that. But that's all speculation right. based on, you know, other kinds of things. So there's no evidence of any writing for the Hopewa. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, although, to keep track of, to even figure out that there's an 18.6 year long cycle of the moon, you would have to probably take observations of the moon rise and moon set over a couple of generations. So it seems to me there must have been some way whether it was on birch bark scrolls that haven't been preserved in the ground because the acid soils would have uh, decomposed them, um, or, or maybe like the knotted cords of the kipu of the Inca, mm -hmm. and, and those also may have not been preserved. They must have had some way of, of keeping track of knowledge, but it very well could have been a very sophisticated oral tradition, a uh, complicated set of oral traditions that you know were maintained in that way. That's not at all out of this, the imagination, but and the geometry that they were doing, building circles and squares that had the same area, building circles of the same size here in Newark and 60 miles away in Chillicothe. I mean, that seems to me to speak to a kind of knowledge of a guild, perhaps, of you know architects, that I don't see how you do that without having stuff recorded in some way. Right. To be an architect, to, to make that circle being... Uh, not perfectly circled by just a couple yards, I yeah, guess. Yeah, how do you do that without a plan? Right, right. Now, you brought up Chillicothe, and I'm glad you did, because um, there is a line of the mounds that point in the direction of Chillicothe, yep. correct? Yep. And which is another huge center of Hopewell culture. It is the center. I mean, it is it is uh, the archaeologist Nomi Gruber, the late Nomi Gruber, uh, one of the you know, greatest Pope archaeologists that I, that I know, and she was a mentor to me. In one place, she described that as the, the center of the, the epicenter of the explosion that became Hopewell. So, yeah, there are more earthworks, more diverse earthworks, more amazing things buried in mounds in the Scioto Valley or in Chillicothe than anywhere else. Newark is kind of like a strange outlier, but the design seems to pull together like the great circle and the square here, or like the Hopeton earthworks, which is a circle and a square in Chillicothe. Uh -huh. The circle in the octagon is one other circle in an octagon, and it's high bank works in, in just south of Chillicothe. Okay. Um, the circles are identical in size, and both circles incorporate the 18.6 year long lunar cycle. Um, we've got the uh, Cherry Valley ellipse that's been destroyed, but that's where all the burial mounds were. That's a little bit like Mound City. So, my personal feeling, my personal guess, is that Hopewell starts in Chillicothe. That's where the explosion starts, and people work out the astronomy and geometry. And then at some point, some group comes up here with all that knowledge and recreates it here in one coherent composition that's like the masterpiece Hopewell architecture ever built anywhere, you know? Like a culmination of everything that, that the Hopewell represented but they do it up here, and the fact that it's near Flint Ridge, I don't think is a coincidence. Flint Ridge was very important in that Hopewell interaction story. Man, 
So you mentioned the mounds. When people think about the mound builders, they automatically think about burial mounds. And you said that there was uh, the burial mounds is in the eclipse in our area here. The, the ellipse. Or ellipse. Yeah. Um, what I, were bodies buried there? Were people uh, cremated, deposited there? So how does like the uh, the burial mounds exactly tie into their religion and faith or the bigger picture? Yeah, we don't know so much about these mounds because they were simply destroyed by first the Ohio Canal, then the Central Ohio Railroad, which used the mounds to fill to make the railroad embankment, and then later just by Newark growing up over it. In fact, for the, the eastern part of the Newark Earthworks, Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis, who did one of the early maps and that was published in the very first publication of the Smithsonian Institution, uh -huh. they wrote about Newark that the ancient lines can now be traced only at intervals among gardens and outhouses. Oh, and wow. they predicted that 50 years from now, the people of Newark will have to look at our map to even know this existed. We can be very grateful that that didn't come true, that the people and citizens of Newark found ways to preserve the Great Circle and the Octagon Earthworks. But to get back to the, the burial mounds, I mean, that's one important point, that, that these aren't burial mounds. People think all Indian mounds are burial mounds, and it's not the case. There was a cemetery where there were burial mounds here, um, but this probably wasn't involved in it. There are reports of some human remains coming out of pits associated with like where the floor exhibits building was. But we don't know what that exactly was. Was it a burial? Or was it an artifact made from human bones? We just don't. We don't have the artifact. We just have this 1800s report. Don't know the extent to which human remains may have figured in ceremonies that took place here. But they may have. But the focus of that mortuary activity was a mile, two miles that way, the Blue Cherry Valley Ellipse. And for Hopewell, we have both cremations and extended burials that weren't cremated. And it probably depended on why the people, how the people died, why they were being buried there, their importance. Um, and I don't know if you're if you're cremated, does that mean you're more important than if you're buried with an extended mm -hmm. burial or less important? Or is it just different, apples and oranges? I don't know that, but, but both of those were ways that people were treated after they had died. In the article that I keep referring to, mm -hmm. uh, it mentions mica mm -hmm. being used in some of the burials, like sheets of mica. Yeah. Now, did, would that designate a class, possibly, and um, where would we get the mica from? Well, the mica comes from the Appalachian Mountains of North and South Carolina. And mica, if you don't know, it's, it, comes, it comes in these sheets, it's mineral that occurs in layers, and you can peel them off in really silvery, glistening sheets. And the Hopewell peeled those off, cut them into shapes like an open hand, a, a raptor claw, a uh, human torso with no legs or arms, I mean, a, a, a spear point carved out of the mica. Um, and those figure prominently, I'm sure they figure prominently here. In fact, that Squire and Davis report I told you about from the Smithsonian, um, there's a footnote there that says a burial mound that the Ohio Canal cut through had 40 bushels of mica in it. Whoa, that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, uh, Eagle Mound. When it was excavated in 1928 by Emerson Greenman of the Ohio History Connection, it was found to cover the site where there was a longhouse. And on the floor of that longhouse, in the, I guess that would be the western part of the floor, there were scraps of mica, where these mica cutouts probably had been made. And on the eastern part of the floor, there were two copper artifacts, a copper crescent and a copper beaver effigy. Um, and so it looks like mica was restricted to one set of ceremonies in one part of that building, whereas copper had perhaps a complementary or a contrasting purpose in another part of that, that, that ceremonial lodge. So each of these different raw materials and substances seems to have had its own particular significance, its own particular power, the particular circumstances in which it was appropriate to use it. But we don't know what those were. We just know that they did have those special purposes. Okay. We know where the copper came from. We used to say, 
and this isn't wrong. We used to say it came from the upper Great Lakes up in like uh, southern Ontario. There's a whole bunch of raw copper out there that's like pure copper. Um, but we now know from chemical studies that it, it comes from there, but there's also some that comes from the southern Appalachian Mountains too. There are copper sources there. Um, so that we're getting better at figuring out exactly where they're getting stuff. And they get copper from both places. Okay. So the person that was buried with mica, they've most likely been pretty important in society in some way. I mean, if you're buried in a mound at all, I think you're important. Because the people that are buried in mounds are a small fraction of all the people that lived here. Okay. So if you're buried in a mound at all, but then if you're buried with mica, or if you're buried with Flint Ridge Flint, and, or seashells, I mean, those mean different things to them. It would have meant different things to those people. Okay. But, I mean, I don't know what it meant. I just know that, yes, that person is special because it's buried with all this regalia. Um, but what that specialness was and what it meant that the person next to them was buried with different stuff, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what any of that means. I mean, maybe someday somebody smarter than I am will help figure this stuff out. Um, but it's part of what makes this job of trying to interpret these ancient cultures so endlessly fascinating. Okay, so we're, we're kind of coming to a close. We talked about all these different things about the Hopewell. What do we know about the end of the Hopewell culture, or the Hopewell period? Well, different archaeologists have different explanations, and there's no one agreed upon explanation for why people stopped doing this. But for me, it's if you compare what's going on in the Hopewell culture with what's going on in subsequent cultures, the things that stand out in Hopewell tiny little communities coming together to build gigantic things with an interaction sphere that spans much of North America. Later people live in larger villages with walls around their villages, more inwardly focused. And the late woodland, a new tool or weapon is introduced, the bow and arrow. The Hopo only had spears. Now both of those are perfectly fine hunting weapons. But the bow and arrow seems to be a better military weapon because it has a much higher rate of fire. Mm -hmm. So my feeling is that the Hopewell, in a sense, were victims of their own success. Those little villages you know, get bigger and they get, become more of them because the population is growing. And at some point, you reach sort of carrying capacity where instead of cooperating, cooperating with each other, villages are arguing with each other over who's you know, farmland that is, or whose deer that was that you just shot. But as soon as that happens, all of this that depended entirely on cooperation collapses, and people start fighting to get, fighting with each other, and when that happens, you can't live in your little homestead anymore. You gang together with the rest of your kin, build a larger village, build a wall around it, so that you guys can take care of each other. And then that's what we see, actually, in that late woodland period is that sort of thing happening. So that's what I think happened. I think uh, competition, warfare, disagreements with people in, due to increased population density saw, saw the end of all this. It's like Rome in a way. It got so big for its own good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so if there were one or two things that you would like a young history person or an older history person, somebody who's interested to know about the Circle Mound or the Hobo people, what would be the takeaways? What would be the one or two points we'd like them to know? One we already mentioned is that not every burial mound, not every Indian mound is a burial mound. Giant mounds, earthworks, were built by American Indian civilizations for thousands of years. Many different cultures built mounds for many different reasons. So just because it's a mound doesn't mean it's like, oh, that's an Indian mound and you've explained it, or a burial mound. But the other thing I want to point out is that we have lots of bizarre, outrageous people coming out with ideas about what these mounds represent. Ancient aliens, um, giants, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. These mounds were built by the ancestors of American Indians. And I think that's what, probably the most important thing I would want people to know when they came away from this. That American Indians aren't and weren't savages. They, they, they were responsible for these amazing civilizations they were brilliant people with knowledge of geometry and astronomy and did tremendous things. So those are the two things I'd want to take, them to take away, or ideally even to know when they got here. That's perfect. Like that, I couldn't have said it better myself. That's awesome. 
All right, folks. So that's the interview with Mr. Leffer. I hope you learned something. I hope when you get a chance to visit Ohio, and uh, especially if you're coming around Newark or some of the other areas like Chillicothe, you take the time to visit these sacred, awesome historic treasures. We, it's a state treasure and certainly a national treasure that we share with you. So please come out and visit it. Visit the Ohio History Connection up in Columbus. They have an incredible museum to also visit. Um, please leave